How you been? I'm pretty good. Uh, you're here for a couple reasons. One, I have a Mount Rushmore of my favorite people in the world who I haven't met. And it is David Letterman. It is Steve Martin. It's Howard Stern and Adam Duritz. So three remain, but you check it off my list now. I've got all of those except for Steve Martin. You haven't met Steve Martin? No. <laughs> seen him. But I've seen you on Letterman a bunch of times. Did you guys have a close relationship? Uh, he's a really shy guy. Um, he would come up and talk to me when we were on the show, and then he would he would say something like, "Hey, I'm you know I'm really glad you're here. Uh, it's really <laughs> it's really nice to have you." And then he'd walk off, and that's the first time we were on the show. He came up and did that. I was sitting in the audience watching, and he came behind me, and uh, then this crew guy walks by and goes, "Wow, man." He's got to really love you. He he won't talk to anybody. Oh, that was a lot. Yeah, and and but he was always really nice. Just he just seems very shy. Um, and I'm not great at like the social thing either. So, yeah, I'm very awkward when I don't have to be on. Like I, if I'm doing stand up or doing this show, I'm a lot. But then when I'm not, I feel very just wallflower type because I feel like why would anybody want to hang out with me if I'm not doing what I'm celebrated at. So at times they're like, man, you're so odd. Or I have like social anxiety at times. But same situation it sounds like with you as you're like a front man of this major band that sold millions and millions of records. But then are you like that when you're just in public as well? Uh, I mean, I'm still me. But I, I mean, the thing about being on stage is I, um, that, that's kind of where I'm supposed to be. I'm, at, I'm most comfortable there because I, I know what I'm doing. And uh, I, I, I kind of feel like I was born to do that. So when I'm on stage, I'm really comfortable because I'm doing the thing I'm best at life at, you know, best in life at. Whereas, you know, hanging out, talking to people, it's, it's not as easy. Um, yeah, I still wish I'd hung out with Steve Martin. <laughs> Howard well, I've known for 30 years. Howard I've known forever. Like know him, know him? Yeah, yeah. You like him? Oh, Howard's fantastic. He's a great guy. Is he like that too? Seems like he on, on air, he's big and bold, and then off air, he's just like normal and... Yeah, he's Quiet. a lot shyer in real life too. But he's also like, you know, he's, he's funny. He's still himself. You know, he's. We used to. I, I met because a friend of mine runs this whole kind of physical medicine center, kind of a gym thing in, in New York, and uh, so I always went there to work out, and and Howard did too. So we like we had this 11 a.m. kind of workout group with uh, me and him, our friend Marco Battaglia, who was playing for the Bengals then. He's a tight end for the Bengals, and uh, and Matt Schneider, who was playing, uh, he was a defenseman for the Rangers, and the four of us would all work out with our friend Pat. Same weights? No, nah, different weights. Oh, I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I had the big ones. Marco <laughs> couldn't keep up. You know? uh, for the stage for you, when did that become? You said you're good at it. Were you naturally drawn to the stage to be a performer? Were you performing at seven, eight, nine years old? Yeah, it might have been showing off at home, but no, not really. We were just talking about this in there because uh, one of our managers uh, worked for Kiss for a while. And uh, I, I realized I'd never told my tour manager. Who, he's been my tour manager since 1994. But, you know, the, when I was a kid, you know, I had Destroyer, the record, the Kiss record. And at one point, I sang Beth to some girls behind Hebrew school. And the response was good. It was a very good response. And I thought... Oh yeah, this is this is probably good for me. And I started a band right after that, like I was thirteen, I guess, with some some friends. Uh and uh yeah, but it was it was Kiss and Beth. That's my first thing. I sang that to some girls behind Hebrew school and I was like, Oh shit, yeah, this, this is this is really good. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're just back there and you just start singing to them like just how do, how does that come about? Yeah, I don't remember. This is it just I was, was good. I was 12, yeah. 13, okay. but at some point, it, like, it, it really, somehow I managed to work my way into it, <laughs> and uh, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. And, and not just like, oh, that's good, but oh, it's this is a good thing to do in front of girls. And they is, like it. Yeah. Which yeah. Is, all you really need in life is find something really good to do in front of girls. And then, you, you know, life will pay off. Yeah, I'm still looking for that, that whatever it is that I do this <laughs> uh -huh. for. So yeah. with, with you and you, a lot of my friends that are, have been successful in music, they kind of went through different phases musically. Like I have one friend who's massive in country music now, but he was in like a metal band for a long time. And so he had went through all these different 
seasons, we'll call them that. Did you do that as a teenager, late teens, early 20s? Did you do music that wasn't really what we know you for now? Like, were you ever in a thrash band? No, but I, funk bands. and But I don't know if they were funk bands. We just played a lot of different music. Uh, I mean, I grew up in, you know, growing up in Oakland and Berkeley, uh, we had some really good FM radio stations, KSAN especially, and they played kind of everything. Uh, you know, you could be listening to The Stones and then The Sex Pistols and then Willie Nelson and then some Miles Davis song. KSAN seemed to play everything. Um, and I just thought that's what music was like. I, re I really just thought this is all what it is. It's everything. And uh, so... You know, especially growing up in Oakland, there's a lot, you know, P-Funk and Earth, Wind & Fire is really big, but there's a punk scene in San Francisco, too. And uh, I just kind of listened to everything and sort of played anything. Some of the bands that played covers, we played covers by anybody. Um, but I was never into any particular scene. I was just kind of liked music, liked playing all of it. You know, experimented with different kinds of stuff when I started writing, finally. Um, but, uh... No, it was all just kind of me. At 16, 17 years old, when, did you know you wanted to do, or you could even do music as a career? No, no. I, it was, I didn't write my first song until freshman fall term in college. Um, but as soon as I did that, like, you know, I think a lot of life is trying to figure out who you are and what you are. You're very unformed as a kid, you know, and... I mean, basically, you just do homework and try to meet girls. It's all that, you know, it's social life and homework. Um, but when I wrote a song, it was like a light switch clicking. I just, oh, I'm a songwriter. And, you know, when I was 18, I just, oh, I'm a songwriter. That's what I do in life. And, and then every day, all I did was write songs. Uh, was that song about your sister? It was, yeah. It was uh, called Good Morning, Little Sister. Um, you know, there was a lounge across the hall from my dorm room and uh there was a piano in it and i was in like some class in college and i start my sister was home she was 16 it's a tough time to be a girl and uh i just started writing a song about her you know kind of humming it to myself and writing lyrics on while i was in class and i went back to my room and i thought you know i wonder if i could figure out how to play this because i could kind of play piano not any really. lessons as a kid i took piano lessons when I was a little kid, but I don't think I got much out of it. It was more that in that first band I was in when I was like 13, the guitar player taught me how to make a major and a minor chord. And once you can do something that sounds good, you can just kind of play, uh, sort of rudimentary. So I went back to the lounge after class and I sort of like, dink, 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 dink. That seems like the note I'm singing. Tried to find a chord that went with it. You know, it's a really simple song. It took me the rest of the afternoon. Like, it would probably take five minutes to write it now, but it took the whole day. I just cut the rest of my classes. But then I sort of like, oh, I, I wrote a song. I can play it. I can sing it. Yeah, I'm a songwriter. It, I realized it right then, and then all I did was write songs after that for, you know, all the time. So were you naturally pretty good at music, at hearing it, and or were you just so driven to be good at it because you saw what the rewards could be? Like, where do you kind of fall on that scale? It's more the driven thing. I'm not I'm not a good piano player. I can't play by ear at all. I got to kind of figure it out or just fumble it out. Um, but it wasn't even so much the rewards except the reward of like, oh, this is who I am. You know, you kind of run around in life feeling things and not knowing where to put it, feeling like you have things to say or like you have all this stuff to express, but you have no idea how to do that. You know, because what are you going to be in school plays? Unless you write songs... Either you're in a cover band or you're in school plays or something. It didn't didn't really seem like there was a line of expression there. But then when you write a song, it's like, oh, this is I can take all this stuff in here and I can put it out here. You know, it's like you turn your liquid thoughts into something solid and it, suddenly it's this place where you can express yourself. And I just did it all day every day after that. Like I cut class a lot and I just... I couldn't get out of that lounge across the hall from my room. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was a distraction once you found what seemingly is the most positive thing that you had ever found, that you loved writing music and creating music. And was that a distraction from school? And I guess it was because that's all you focused on or felt like you were focusing on? Yeah, I mean, I, I did it all day, all the time. Uh, 
I just wanted to con I don't write nearly that much now. Um, but back then I wrote like con I couldn't stop. I couldn't get myself away from the piano. I just did it all day, every day. Um, just pumped out songs for a while there. I think it's like, you know, you just suddenly I was defined. Like before any of my friends, I knew what I was. I mean, I fell behind again after that when they all got jobs and I <laughs> had no way to get I didn't know how to turn this thing into something that could actually support myself. So there's, you know, years of landscaping and uh, construction work and dishwashing. I worked in a video store, you know, all through my 20s. I knew what I was before any of my friends, but I spent 10 years after that, you know, just doing everything I could to keep going while while I tried to, like, figure out how to make something of that. Did you finish school? Uh, I didn't turn in my thesis. I'm missing one paper from Berkeley. So does that mean you're like a few hours, like credits short? Yeah. And one, why haven't you done class. the thesis? Why haven't you done the paper? Well, in my AI, <laughs> I'll write you one right now. All I got to do is get on chat GPT and knock yeah. it out. Oh, that's not going to work at Berkeley. Oh, that? <laughs> that's the best English department in the country. <laughs> They'd catch that. No, I, you know what? In my mind, I've kind of written several theses and they've sold briskly. Yeah. Um, but I they, mean, I, no. they, they won't let you like write, write the paper though for that. You don't care to have the degree? No, I mean, look, I really respect my education. I, I, Cal, I learned to be, I was an English major there. I learned to be a writer there. It was very hard. And I, a lot of what I am as a songwriter comes from that. Uh, so I have a lot of appreciation for it. But I didn't turn in my thesis. So I'm not sure I should have a degree. I mean, I'm, I am sure I shouldn't because I, I didn't, I didn't finish. You can write it now. Lunchbox, do you relate to this? Yeah, it feels good, man. I, I feel like I've experienced life. So He's I, short, too, one credit, like one class. And so I feel like, you know what I mean? Like, we went out, we we, we took what we learned, and we made it something out of our lives. And so... We. Yeah, same we. thing. Right, really? Yeah, yeah like, now we're in this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Clearly. I mean, no I, I don't really have a problem with it. Parallel. I, I feel like, you know, there are people that did finish all their stuff, and they got the degree. I have a lot of respect for my school, so, you know, they taught me a lot. But I didn't turn in the paper, so I'm okay with not having the degree. It worked out for me. I, the degree's not that important. The education is. I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd be where I am without that education. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I have a, a world of appreciation for what I went through in school. Um, I wish they could have. I did get into a situation where once you start writing songs, it's very different, the mindset, than, than writing essays. And... Uh, and I, the songwriting started to bleed into how I wrote essays. And I had teachers, while well, I'm writing these very expressive, almost semi-poetic uh, essays, going, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, you, not, you need to write me a second paper. This is an, I got several incompletes where they then demanded I have to write a second paper to explain the first paper. And uh, that only got me in more trouble because somehow I was probably fairly obnoxious about the explanatory paper. Did you ever almost quit music though because you had to grind it out doing all of these jobs like again mowing and that's what I had to do too I had to do a lot of the waiting tables did you ever almost quit yeah after my first real like adult band uh you know it's hard you're you you play with your friends but you got to kind of argue with them you end up fighting over a lot of stuff it's part of being in a collaborative art form is a lot of fighting and disagreements and I felt like I got really separated from all my best friends and uh i got kind of turned off to sort of the reality like look when hobby is something you do for fun like art is not fun it's not supposed to be it's work but it's hard for people to realize that at first uh, and that's kind of something everyone who wants to be involved in art has to kind of go through is a moment where you sort of think at first you think oh well this isn't fun anymore and so you don't, either you and you don't like it and so if it's a hobby you stop but you have to kind of get over that hump. And I went through that after that first band, you know, when it broke up and I sort of didn't like the taste of my mouth on it. I kind of went to Europe backpacking and uh, was going to try to cut, make a break and quit playing music. And I was going to come back and get on with my life. I was about 25, I guess. So you quit in your head, at least for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And I went backpacking around Europe with some friends. But... The night before we left, I got together with uh, the bass player from my old band, Marty Jones, actually, Mr. Jones. Um, and he took me to another friend of his, who's Dave Bryson, who's 
I started Counting Crows with. And we were Dave had a little a studio, and we worked on some music and came up with some stuff that was really good. Um, and uh, and then I left for the trip. It was just kind of a fun night to do it. While I was over there, Emmer, uh, our guitar player, who's been my best friend for all these years, we lived together back then. Uh, he had he was he had joined Camper Van Beethoven, uh, and they were on. I got a letter from him that he was on tour with 10,000 Maniacs, you know, who's huge right then. They were getting ready to play the Greek theater. In like Berkeley. Natalie Merchant. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, I just thought, screw this, man. I, like, <laughs> I can't believe he's playing the Greek theater and touring with 10,000 Maniacs. I, I got to get back and start a band. And I started, decided to go back. So you mentioned Marty Jones. That's Mr. Jones. You guys are kind of imagining what fame is like or what celebrity is like. How long did you write that song before that actually happened? Oh, um, a while. I mean, I'm, Mr. Jones is from sort of the middle version of Counting Crows. It was probably about 1990, 91. Something like that. And so did you guys write it like, man, this would be awesome, or this is going to happen. We, we really can see this happening to us. Oh, uh, no. I mean, <clears throat> Marty's dad, David Serva, is one of the few Americans. He had left America and gone to move, move to Madrid. And he's one of the few American guitar players to ever make it in the flamenco scene in Spain. He's a brilliant flamenco guitar player. And he had a huge career in, uh, in Madrid, which is pretty rare. And he came back to America at one point uh, for a visit, and he played some shows with his old flamenco troupe in the city, in the Mission, uh, San Francisco. And uh, so we went to see them one night, and then we all went out drinking afterwards, and he got pretty wasted. And we ended up in this one bar, the New Amsterdam on Columbus Street. And, uh, you know, we were sitting at the bar, and, all these really beautiful flamenco dancers and we're not really getting anywhere with them and in the corner of the bar i'm looking over and chris isaac's uh drummer kenny dale johnson is in the corner at this booth with like three girls sitting there with him and i'm just thinking man we gotta get our shit together man because like if we were rock stars it would be a lot easier to talk to women <laughs> everything would be better you know it'd be kind of great I just thought that was kind of funny, the thought of it, because, like, you, you know, you, you it's not just because of girls in a corner. You know, you dream about things. Like, if you're going to write songs, you dream about being able to do that with your life and support yourself. And, you know, we were spending this evening with this flamenco troupe, and David Serva, his dad, is, like, you know, famous guitar player over in Spain, and Kenny's in the corner. And, you know, it's just what we wanted to do with our lives, plus the girl thing. But it also occurred to me how silly that is. It's like... Nothing like that solves all your problems in life. It just doesn't work that way. You know, it may be great for some things. But it's not going to fix who you are. Um, and, and I got home at night, and I was sort of thinking about, like, how the whole thought process was so funny to me, and I, and I wrote the song. Did, was it one of those that fell out? Like yeah, the, pretty much. Really? I mean, I don't know, you know. Well, anything. wrote it all that night. Anything in front, in front of five hours. I was almost like falling out. Yeah, I think. Most of my songs back then were probably less than five hours. and I get real determined and just sit there and do it until it's done. Whenever I think about me in college and those really formative years, for me listening to music, I probably listened to more than any other body of music, the Across the Live Wire, you guys' live album. I mean, I could tell you, and now my favorite band, uh, Counting Crows, I can do every even spoken part of that. You know, some people have movies, some people, and for mine, it's that. And even at the end, I like to think Dog's Eye View. You know, you're doing the whole, the river, it's so, but I listen to that so much that if you were to say, what's the music you listen to in those formative years that made you musically who you are today? If I ask you that question, what did you listen to so much at 18 to 22 or 23? You're like, yep, that's what reminds me of those years. Uh... I listened to a lot of REM, uh, U2 probably at the time. Uh, still probably listening to a lot of Jackson 5. That's my first record. Uh, I don't think I've really stopped listening to that. Um, Roxy Music around then too. Jay Giles Band, P-Funk. Um, I don't know. 
It's hard to remember it right at that one time. I was thinking of you uh, two and uh, REM because I I specifically remember there's a few things in my mind that are needle drop records where I literally remember when you put the needle on the record and how it started, and I have very clear memories of like being that freshman year in college and listening to Chronic Town, that first REM EP, and uh, uh, War, putting the needle down and hearing Sunday Bloody Sunday. Like, I, re- I remember those two really vividly. And I remember going to the Roxy Music concert right around then, that last tour. You ever see Jackson 5? Yeah, that's my first concert, too. Do you remember it? Or do, were you told a lot about it? No, nah, vaguely. I was probably about six. It was a rodeo in Texas. Um, and they played at it. I went one day and saw the Jackson 5. My sister went the next day with my parents and saw Sonny and Cher. <laughs> I, I would the rodeo is still doing that too, by the way. Same kind of deal where it's somebody yeah. different and awesome every single day. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have been happy with either one of those, but the Jackson Five, you know, that was. I have vague memories, but I, I'm sure they're really mixed in with TV clips of the Jackson Five. You know, I'm sure it's not really a memory because it's a long time ago. Now, if you get famous, there's all the social media that comes at you, um, and I've had different smaller ish type events where it's just like, wow. But when you blow up in the 90s and 2000s and fame is not able to get to you through those means, how does fame get to you if you're always on the road moving around? Is it just crowds? Is it just people? Well, it, you know, it's weird. We'd been on the road for a while before it happened, really. And it had been building. You know, we played Saturday Night Live in January of 94 and we weren't even in the top 200. I mean, Mr. Jones was kind of a hit on the radio, but it, it wasn't making any impact anywhere. The record, like I said, it was 214 or something. Uh, but we played Saturday Night Live, and it jumped 40 spots a week for five weeks. And we ended up in the top, I don't know, 13, then six, and then two for the next two years or so. But uh, I didn't really see, you know, we were on the road on our own for a while at Christmas, and we seemed to be a kind of a hot indie band for a little bit. And then we went back to opening for Cracker, and then in April, we went to Europe for our first European tour, and we were gone for the month of April. Um, and we flew back from Europe and landed in New Orleans right before Jazz Fest. And I'd been going to Jazz Fest for years, so I'd spent a lot of time in New Orleans. As a fan? Yeah, watching? Just, Got it. Yeah, because we weren't before the band, really. Um, this was my first time at Jazz Fest after the first record was out. And I went to the festival the first day after we got there and got mobbed. And I... I the things that had been building that spring and winter had happened. It had kind of all coalesced while we were in Europe. So I didn't realize it. Were you surprised by the mobbing? Yeah. It scared the crap out of me. It like just it's like, like when someone waves at you and you wave back and you realize there's somebody behind you they're waving at? Yeah. Like somebody think they're running to them? Somebody wanted a picture and an autograph or something. And then the crowd just gathered and gathered and gathered and gathered and, and didn't stop. And then... Later that night, we played Tipitina's, and, you know, fits about 800 to 1,000 people in Tipitina's, and there were 2,000 people outside on the neutral ground in the street. They kind of had to close off the street, and uh, we went outside after the show. They had to open, they opened, like, they had these wall doors that slide out, I think, and they opened them up so the crowd outside could hear, too. We went outside to play a couple songs acoustically for them after the show, and, and it was just massive, and, and uh, that's when I realized... Like, it had happened while we were in Europe. And so whatever buildup there was going to be, we missed it. And it just, we just landed in this thing. Isn't that crazy? It was really weird. I mean, that the next, you know, few months were very strange. I remember being on tour and being in Birmingham and having a day off and deciding there was like a movie theater about four blocks from the hotel. And I walked down and I was watching this movie. There's no one in the theater but me. It was weird. It was like an afternoon show, a matinee or something. And this guy comes walking down the aisle and then walks up the row and sits next to me. And I was like, hey. And the whole like, empty theater says right yeah. next to <laughs> And he said, hey, uh, I'm a really big fan. I was like, uh, thanks, man. And he said, do you mind if I sit here? I'm like, look, I'm, I'm just trying to watch a movie. If you don't mind, I just I just want to watch a movie. you know." And he got up and left. And about 45 minutes later, I saw a guy come down the aisle and come down the road to me again. And I was like, God damn it. And and I, but it wasn't the same guy. It was the guy that was working the concession stand out there. And he said, "Hey, are, are you are you in Counting Crows?" And I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "Listen, uh, I don't know what's going on, but there was some guy in here before, and for the last half hour, he's been on the, the payphone in the lobby, 
calling people and there's a huge crowd outside you know if you want to get out of here there's like a door at the bottom like a alley exit and i said yeah thanks man and i i snuck out the alley and walked down the street and then i heard this noise behind me and i turn around there's this massive crowd of people out the front of the theater and they all start running and i I ran like just ran down the street got to the hotel like ahead of this crowd it was it was just a little while after Jazz Fest. You didn't even have the infrastructure to be famous because it all happened while you were gone. You didn't know you landed. It's here, and you didn't have security. You didn't have anything to make make sure you were even safe. No, never really got any of that stuff either. We never really – I had a lot of friends in bands who had security. We never really got security out with us or any of that stuff. It just seemed like you could sort of avoid it. Uh, it didn't seem to make sense to me walking around with some huge guy next to you. It, it, it seemed to invite more attention than anything else. I never really got into that. Um, even now, at the over the hill age. Uh, now, I mean, I don't know. I never really did the security thing. But yeah, I mean, I was just completely unprepared. But there's the truth is, everybody's unprepared. There's no way to be prepared for that because it's just like everybody start. It's not like you really do anything. Everybody else just starts acting really weird. And there's no way to prepare for that. It's just like waking up on Mars. You know, you could, you'll get used to the gravity after a while, but it takes a bit. What's the best Counting Crows song ever, in your opinion? I don't know. Your opinion. It's a very vague, open question. But what comes to mind first? Well, I think Palisades Park is probably the thing I'm proudest of. But I also think that Long December is a perfect song. Um, Long December is the only song that I've never not wanted to play. Like, I don't... I'm happy to play that every night. I have been happy to play that every night. I don't think I can say that about any other song. There's no other song we play every night. Um, but I never mind playing Long December. There's something perfect about it and timeless. And I'm really proud of, like, the Palisades Park was really hard to write, and it's a pretty epic thing. Uh, I'm really proud of it. It's complicated. It's a, a height of my art form. But Long December is perfect. Did you feel that way when you finished Long December? Yeah. It almost, more than any other song, that one kind of wrote itself. It just felt like I knew where to go with the chords. I knew exactly what it was supposed to sound like. The entire song was written and recorded in under 24 hours. Um, it just, that's like take six. Do There's you no write, overdubs. Do you write melody or lyric first or how does your brain work with music because you know a lot of my friends will like have this idea this is the lyrics well f- some of my friends will just go and they'll just attach the words after they do the melody what is your process i've never written lyrics first for a song always um, melody first or music first um it usually starts with either the music's there first or the music and the words come at the same time um but yeah i've never written lyrics first because I, I don't think i'd be able to like, to me, there's nothing without the music. So the lyrics kind of are born out of the music. So, like, when you wrote A Long December, unless you did it at the same time, you, you know, da, the piano's playing, and you don't really have, you're just, it's just music, and then you back, listen to it, and you're, then you attach. Na, da, 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 da. I think I just did that at the same time. I got the, I mean, I may have written, once I had the music down, written the the rest of the words, but I'm, I think I got that verse right there. I'm a super fan. You probably can't tell like I'm so cool right now and like just no, it's chill a, and I'm awesome. You know, just cool. Plain it cool, right? Right, guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, so yeah. cool. You ever weirded out by yes, super fans? Man. You ever weirded out by Never people that are too fan, too fan of you? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I thought, well, that's why I'm playing it cool, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm playing it cool. Well, also, it's like I kind of feel like I always want to tell people you should listen to some other stuff too. <laughs> Because there's, I mean, for me, I love music. It's been my whole life. I've, I've, I spent, you know, the first half of my life as a, you know, the first 20 years as just a fan of everything. I just love music. And then I started making music, which is great too. And I remain someone who's obsessed, lo- geekily loves music. And I, I just want to shake people sometimes and go, nah, yeah, this is great. I love my records, but you should check out these guys. You guys are great, and these guys, and these guys, and these guys, and there's just so much. I, I don't think I could spend all that time listening to one thing. 
I just, I, and I love, I think our band is great, but it's mostly just that I, I kind of want to like sit him down and say, you seem really great. <laughs> you obviously have great taste. You like us that, you know, you should check out these guys. You know. I had a real problem with, and I loved Hard Candy, your album, but I'd have to skip to the, like, you go to the hidden track. I could hold the, the forward button down on the CD player. That finally would get to, it finally come up and it would be uh, the Johnny Mitchell song. Oh, yeah. Big Yellow Taxi. It was the hidden track when I first bought the record. And I was like, I don't know who knows about this song. This because any of my other friends are lame and they don't spend the time holding that button down. You got to hold, you can't push it. You got to hold it like middle so it, it skips or you have to just let it play forever to get to it. And it was like, boom, and it starts. And I'm like, you guys don't even know what you're missing. I'm cooler than you. Boom. And then it comes out as a single, and you had a Vanessa Carlton. And then I remember the video, she wasn't even with you guys. And I, I was hurt. Which part? That she wasn't with you in the video because they probably recorded it two different times. She was probably on tour. We were on tour. Yeah. I just, I need, I don't know how I felt about that. Why, why, how did that come about? Because I felt as a hardcore fan that I was the one that knew the secret that nobody else knew, and then everybody got let in on the secret. We had kind of this hip-hop acoustic version that we did of uh, Big Yellow Taxi Guy. I couldn't remember the name right then. Uh, and then we wanted to try and do, like, some remixes of it. And so we went and tried and find some people like Pharrell, uh, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis. I really wanted to do it with Jimmy Jam. Uh, but they were busy when we were doing it. They couldn't do it right then. You know, we were. it was like a... An acoustic track we recorded it was just going to be hidden on the end of the record and when we decided to do a remix version of it uh it kind of came sort of late um ron fair who was uh, an a and r guy at geffen then but had also just finished producing uh vanessa's first album and uh i had heard some of it because he had mixed it with jack joseph puig right before we mixed hard candy so Jack was playing me stuff from it, and I thought it was really good. Um, but we had to leave for, like, some tour in Europe right after we were done with that. And Ron called me and said, hey, uh, I have an idea for – I know you're trying to find someone to remix this song. So you were actively looking for someone else to be on the track. Yeah, because we wanted to do – not someone to be on it, but we wanted to do a remix of it. So we never got to do that kind of stuff, like working with hip-hop producers to take our music and just change it and do something different with it. Um and Ron called and said, I have a really good idea for this. Would you mind if I sent it to you? Could I try and do this? And I said, sure, go ahead. And he sent it to me, and it was actually really good. So I said, yeah, let's work on this. Um, so he started doing it, but I had to leave to go to Europe for about, you know, a little while before. We had a tour in Europe before the record was coming out. So we were out of the country. And uh, Ron met us in London. With, he'd almost finished it, and we, we laid down some more tracks. I changed the ending and sang some stuff on it. Um, and then we wanted to have some woman sing on it as well. And we were talking about Nora Jones. We were talking about some different people. I suggested Vanessa because I knew I couldn't be there. And I thought it would be pretty intimidating for someone to sing on one of our tracks. And I didn't want someone to do some kind of flat boring version of it. But Vanessa had just finished doing a record with Ron. So I thought she'd be really comfortable in the studio with him, even though she was a kind of an unknown artist. I just said, why don't you do it with Vanessa, this that girl? That song, had, A Thousand Miles, hadn't hit yet? I don't think it had. The record wasn't out yet because they were mixing the same time we were. So maybe it had just come out. I, I'm not sure. But it wasn't the monster hit. No, she. I don't think anyone knew who she was. I just thought, I need to find someone who will be comfortable without me being there. So they'll let go and really sing. And I knew she could really sing. Um, I was just afraid someone would be too shy and they would do bland stuff. And, and so I suggested this woman he'd just worked with. Uh, so he went and did that, but then Geffen got on this. They, they needed to turn the record in right away, and they didn't have time to finish that. So we, the first, it was not supposed to be a single. It was supposed to be a single like a year later. So that's why we put it as a hidden track. So we put it out on the first pressing and uh, hidden. And the idea was it, after we go through all the other singles on a record, if we want to put out Big Yellow Taxi, there'll be another pressing. We'll actually list it on the record. It won't be hidden anymore. Um then two weeks notice came along the movie and said, we want to use this song in our film and we want to put it out as a single. We'll make a video. We'll do all this stuff. And sort so the song came out long before it was supposed to. The problem with that is it was still a hidden track on the record. 
So no one knew it was there. Except so, for me, who got mad that my secret was not put out. You're the only yeah. one. You should have told everybody. Because yeah. the problem was. How did you find out? What'd you say? How did you, how did you know, Bobby, that the, it was a, there was a hidden track? Because I listened to every freaking second of the whole album over mm. and over again. And, and so, it says the time remaining on it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I just held it down to get to the end of the track and then it would start. I mean, yeah. the idea for me was always that people forget your CDs on and that it would just like surprise them. You know, uh, well, the problem was the song came out and it was a massive hit, but it, it didn't do anything for the record because it was still hidden. So people would come to the store and they didn't buy hard candy because it's not on the record. You know, so it, it was actually. I get why Geffen was so excited about having the movie to promote it, and they were really in a rush to put out another single, but it sort of backfired on them because backfired on all of us because it didn't do anything for the record. <laughs> it was a massive hit that did nothing for our record at all because no one knew it was. It was still, yeah. I mean, it was supposed to be out a year later when it wouldn't have been hidden on a different pressing, and Vanessa would have been on it by then and all that stuff, but uh, none of that happened. All right, you got five questions left. The Shrek song, which is how a lot of kids would know you. Accidentally in Love, was that written purposefully for that movie or was it a song that you guys, or that you had already had somewhat and thought, this will be right, let's, you know, turn it into that? How'd that come? No, that was written for the movie. I, I got a call about doing it. I went over to, uh, you know, DreamWorks, Amblin, Spielberg studio there, and I sat with the director and Michael Austin, I think, and they showed me basically the whole movie, scene by scene. And the ones that weren't finished, they showed me storyboards for it, and we talked it through, and uh, they showed me the scene they wanted and kind of told me the flavor. Uh, there was a Weezer song on there originally just as a temp track, I think. Uh, so I took home a little DVD of it and went to work on it and wrote it for the movie. When you watched it, was Chris Farley, the voice of Shrek, before Mike Myers, when you saw it? Because he died, obviously, and they had to change it. No, it was Mike Myers then, was... I'm pretty sure. Um, I thought that was a really great thing. I mean, there are very few things in our culture that are timeless. You know, like, not much lasts generation after generation, but, like, my grandmother saw Snow White, my mom saw Snow White, I saw Snow White. If I have kids, they'll see Snow White. I mean, the one thing in our culture that is multi-generational that lasts forever is a really good animated movie like that. You know, that stuff is timeless, and it's a chance to be part of something. I mean, you have Miles Davis covering Someday My Prince Will Come. That It spans all cultures. Uh, I, I thought that was... As soon as I got the offer, my whole thought was, this is exactly what I want to do. This is like being on a really good Disney film. It's, it was obviously really good. You know, I saw it. I thought it was fantastic. You know, and also as a chance to, you know, get new fans who are younger. And, you know, uh, I, I was so excited to do that because it'll be there forever. And I'm really proud of the song. And I think the movie's fantastic. You know, we talked about before you came in the tour and we'll get back to that in just a second. And. I've seen you a bunch. Eddie and I went to your show when you were here last time. We were the ones who were cheering. Standing up the whole time. We were were standing up going, yeah, Yeah. that was us. So for a long time, every show we would go to, it seemed as you would change melodies of of the hits. Is it because you played them so much and you were like, I just can't keep singing it over and over again? No, I think I did that from the beginning. I think it always seemed like, they just seemed like living things. You know, I feel like the songs are, you know, it's it's, a... it's like a coffee filter, and you pour your life through it every day. You know, it, they're all different. I mean, and your my perspective on Mr. Jones when I wrote it as something I was, like, aspirational about is certainly different than my perspective now, having actually lived everything in that song for 30 years. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, and that's true of all the songs because they're just things you felt and feel, and so, you know, you experience them a little differently every day. I always felt like this stuff was just – I do think it's why I'm not bored. Because I, I've never really, someone said to me a while ago that we should re-record all of our records like Taylor Swift did because then we'd have all the publishing and we wouldn't have to pay, not the publishing, we'd have all the record rights, we wouldn't have to pay the record company anything on it. But I, I have no idea how those records go. I haven't sang them that way since I recorded them that way. You know, they're kind of, I don't think we'd be very good at that. I thought the last show, though, was pretty I felt like there was an effort to, like, be right. Or maybe I've just heard you sing live so many times that I just feel like that's normal or natural. I didn't feel like there was a lot of change. Did you, Eddie? No, I didn't. I felt like it was, it was awesome. Yeah. Like, and when you play a song like Einstein on the Beach, which I only had, like, a bootleg version of it, is it weird that everybody knows the song? I, I don't know. I have That's a song I played. We played once in concert. I mean, it's basically a demo from before we were a band. It was never even attempted for the record. 
We played it once in concert at this little club in San Francisco, screwed it up, and never played it again. That's it? I don't think it's ever been played since that first time. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a clever song with great melodies, but I've never loved it. It doesn't do anything for me, like, inside. So I, 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 I like it a lot as a fun, clever. It was me trying to write a pop tune. It was like an exercise. But I've never, I've never played it again. That's almost your Radiohead Creep. Well, they played Creep way more times than we well, played. But forever, so, and we're, like, we're not doing yeah. it. So, okay, look, I'm going to mention the tour again. Um, I mean, in so many of the cities that we're on, I'm going to read some of these off, but everything from, you know, Syracuse, Boston. There's so many shows. Raleigh, obviously the Nashville show you're doing here, and you go to countingcrows.com to see all the shows. New Orleans, I mean, it's all of these cities that we're in, you guys, it's an excellent show, but it just seems like it's so much on the road. And when I, if I tour, when I tour, I get to go do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then I come back home and I get to do this job. You ever been on the road so much? You're like, why do I even have a house? Well, I know why I have a house because I'm on the road so much. It's really good to have a place to come home to. Uh, I think the, the weekend thing would be fantastic. That's what Taylor Swift is doing. She's playing weekends. I think that sounds like wonderfully relaxing. But we're not playing stadiums, you know. We can't do that because we can't, we can't afford to do that. I, I also like. I've spent a lot of my life on tour. I, I love playing shows. I love, you know, the the people I know best in my life, my band and my crew. A lot of the same people have been there for thirty years, you know, and that's like family, you know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy in that life. Uh, it's exhausting for sure. But well, it's, it's, it's a job, you know, it's, it's work. But it's definitely pretty satisfying. I mean, look, I was a kid, look, I was, like I said, singing Beth to some kids behind school, it's a pipe dream at that point. It, it is actually how I've managed to support myself in my life. And even after the pipe dream silliness, after I wrote my first songs, I spent 10 years in the clubs, you know, like really not knowing if, if I was going to be able to take care of myself. And I, I've been able to, and not just myself, but a whole group of people that work with us. I, I guess I just, I'm very satisfied with it and proud of it. And yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's, uh, there are, uh, with anything, there are just times when I'm exhausted, like when I just would rather be home. But it's also a life I'm really used to, you know, and I, I still love playing shows, you know, I really do. County Crows Banshee season tour with Dashboard Confessional, which he's coming in a couple days. I'm big, Chris, yeah, yeah, we were talking. He's he's uh he told me he's coming in like a week or something. Yeah. yeah, I was talking with him last night. He's coming up to visit me in about a week. Me and Chris and his wife, my girlfriend, uh, Emmer, our guitar player, and somebody else, we're all going to see Taylor Swift in New York together. They're coming up to stay with us. Do you have to pay for those tickets? Yeah, you. They didn't give you t those tickets for free? Look, I got tickets. I'm fine. I got tickets. You're just happy you got it to buy tickets? Look, I, I understand. It's a business, too. You know, especially at that level, it's like you can't be giving out tickets to everybody because you know, it's just too hard after a while. I, I get that. But I'm happy to support. <laughs> Although, I, I, I'd still like to play weekends and be that successful. We've never gotten to quite be that <laughs> successful. It does seem like a good life. It's uh, 56 dates. It is kicking off June 13th. You can go to countingcrows.com. A uh, quick note, whenever you did the, the last EP, The Butter Miracle, I liked it when it came out all at once. I was like, this is the longest song I've ever heard because the whole th thing came out and it was all just connected. And then later, it all, and, but I remember calling Eddie and going, there's a 20-minute song out. You've got to <laughs> listen to it. And he's like, really? And then I called him back. I was like, wait. Apparently, it was all just tracks. I like One 20-minute song. Let's commit to it now. Well, it is. It's like it's four songs, but they flow together. Yeah, but all of it was so long. It just felt like a twenty-minute song. It was it's awesome. supposed to feel like a twenty-minute song. I mean, in a good way. I was trying to do something like the second side of Abbey Road or the uh, Wild, the Innocent, the, that first side of that. Uh, I just, I just wanted to write something that really flowed that way. It's pretty cool in concert too. It works. I mean, I wasn't even sure it would work. I wrote it to work, but until you're done recording it and you get it all together, I didn't know if it was going to work. That's the most satisfied I've ever been was the when we put it all together and it worked as as when the suite worked, I was about as happy as I've ever been about anything creative. You ever go back and hear an old track and go, man, sonically, I wish I would I would have done it a different way. The, the only things that do that for me a little bit on the first album. The first album has a little bit of a sheen to it, 
that I don't always, I love those songs. And I think some of them got better playing them live. All the other records and stuff, I, I like exactly how it sounds. The first album, which I know is everybody's favorite, but, uh, and I love the songs and the work we did on it. It's just some of the stuff I didn't know enough about making records then is my first record. And uh, a little bit of that one I think is better. Those songs got better live. And I, I learned how to sing them a little better after that. The rest of the records, no, I love the way it all sounds. Everything. Are you a loser if you wear an artist shirt to their concert? Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't either. But no. some, some people think you're a big loser if you do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it looks really bad. Yeah. You look like an idiot when you do that. I don't like, know if you should be wearing your own shirt at your concert. That, Although my tour manager is constantly saying to me, no, if you wore that stuff on stage, we'd sell, <laughs> we'd sell more merch. <laughs> but no, I think, you know, you kind of got to, don't you? I mean, you're going to go there, you're going to buy agree. a shirt, and you put it on. Yes. I don't know. It's been a while since... No, I know I go to concerts and wear band shirts. I, I went to Gang of Youth a little while ago. I was definitely wearing a Gang of Youth shirt. For sure. There you go. It's over. Yeah. That's over. Eddie, question before we go. Okay, a Adam. So I saw you in Houston. I mean, this was probably early 2000s. And speaking of security, we snuck our way back in there, and we made it to oh, your meet and greet. Ouch. More and, and so, But on the way to your <laughs> meet and greet, I saw— um, We had a meet and greet? You did. You, you were playing with live. It wasn't him, dude. Somebody oh, before you. the show. Before the show. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I saw a really big dude, and you're like, this guy's not normal. Who is this? It's Dennis Rodman. And he was back there. What was that like? And who, like, has just come to one of your shows where you're just like, this is crazy. I never knew he was a fan. Dennis. Oh, this is that's like 99. That's a while yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dennis was good friends with the guys in live, and so I knew him through them. And he had his thing, like, Rodman TV back then. And it was like really early internet kind of thing that he had where he, he had a bus and a bunch of strippers. And he would drive around the country filming like internet content. And uh, it was pretty wild. And he he would like, he toured with us for a while. Like he came out to visit live <laughs> and then they had their own bus. So they just traveled around with us for a while. Like coming to shows and hanging out. I mean, Dennis is a fantastic guy. He's amazing. He, you know, he's really different. I kind of love how unique he is, and he can be kind of like brash, but also kind of sensitive. And uh, I, I always, I haven't seen him in a long time, but I loved that guy. He was just wild and fun. You know, we'd go out and do stuff, uh, go to bars. He loved to go to strip clubs, so we'd do that sometimes. We went to uh, one in Atlanta once, like the Cheetah, and he got in an argument with a car in the parking lot. And what? what uh, say it again. He got an argument with a well. He got an argument with a guy, but the guy had a car, and the guy tried to drive the car at Dennis. So Dennis just punched the car. Got it. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> he punched out the car, a moving car. I will say it was a very impressive moment. I was like, it just doesn't seem like he's going to win that confrontation, but I got to tell you, he did. Punched the car, and he won. And it, you don't, you rarely see that. But I, yeah, I mean, Dennis, I, I just thought he was a fantastic guy, like completely unique and out of place in in the NBA in a lot of ways, and just didn't care. Just did his own thing. Yeah, I loved that guy. I haven't seen him in, in years. He was really a good friend of the guys in life. But I, I loved hanging out with him. He was crazy. At Counting Crows, countingcrows.com, the tour, it's almost 60 dates. I will be at the one here. You're playing at the Opry House, which is super cool. But basically every city we're in, you're in. Really been cool to sit with you. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Like this has been, you know, I mean, I might have peed a little. I'm just saying it. It's okay. Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah. <laughs> the last few drops are for the underwear. You know, just yes. uh, ever had to be put alphabetical and stood in line next to Fred Durst. I don't know if I've stood in line. I mean, I knew Fred back then. But Duritz, Durst. Yeah, you'd in think. In class, you guys would be called right after each I'd other. be right in front of him. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Best question I had. <laughs> great. Waited all night for that one. All right, you guys, go uh, <laughs> check out the tour, Counting Crows, countingcrows.com. Adam, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm.